On a warm July afternoon in 1977, Lieutenant Colonel George Mormon sat at his desk on Capitol Hill. He had just returned from months of head-to-head -head competition between General Motors and the Chrysler Corporation for the new M1 main battle tank. The culmination of nearly 20 years of development, the winner featured a 105mm L7 gun, a 12-cylinder diesel engine, and a small, sleek turret. It was made by General Motors. It was a clear winner over the Chrysler, which featured an unreliable turbine engine and a much larger turret. Sporting the same 105mm gun, both were ready to accept an alternative 120mm German-made cannon. Before him lay an envelope of sealed papers, ready to deliver to Congress announcing the winner of the lucrative production contract. All that was needed now was to await a phone call from the Pentagon confirming the decision. Mormon, chief liaison to Congress, had 20 years on the job. He needed a big win to springboard his post-army career. The phone call he received, though, was unexpected. The Pentagon ordered him to withhold the documents and stall Congress. A week later, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld released a memo demanding the tank utilize a turbine engine and a 120mm gun. Four months later, Mormon sat before Congress, announcing the Chrysler Corporation had won the deal. This isn't another story about corruption in the military-industrial complex. Rather, it's a story of the Cold War's transition from confrontation to detente. A story of how sometimes economic prosperity can mean national security. In this case, concerning the ailing Chrysler Corporation and, by a strange twist, the U.S. Air Force. The M1 was never just a tank. It was also a bailout package. And it all started with the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. During the Korean War, America and the Western Coalition were thoroughly embarrassed to be using World War II armor in a post-World War II era. While NATO tanks like the M26 Pershing, M46 Patton, and Centurion had superior penetration to the North Koreans' T-34-85, crews recognized that it was mostly the North Koreans' lack of training that led to their failure. Coupled with this, the bulk of NATO forces were comprised of light tanks, like the M24 Chaffee and M4 Sherman, which proved barely an equal match to Soviet armor. After the conflict, Americans went into crisis mode. Recognizing the strength of Soviet manufacturing, which had produced 100,000 T-34s during the Second World War, compared to America's paltry 49,000 M4 Shermans, fear of the Soviet horde took hold. Americans began rapidly upgrading the M46 Patton. The turret was upgraded to create the M47, then the engine to create the M48 Patton. Meanwhile, the M103 was developed to fill the role of heavy tank, but was beleaguered by engine issues. Sharing the same engine as the M48, it had a top speed of 20 miles per hour, an operational range of only 80 miles, and required rebuild every 500 miles. The M24 Chaffee was replaced by the M41 Bulldog, unfortunately too late to be of service in Korea, and because of the rush production, it too was plagued by technical issues. By October of 1956, all eyes turned to Hungary as a group of students sparked a rebellion against Soviet control. Western powers watched eagerly for a Soviet response, and right on cue, 30,000 Red Army conscripts and 1,100 armored vehicles rolled in. Eager to gain intel on Soviet equipment, a British army officer, having spotted the new and ultra-secret Russian T-54 deployed in country, covertly facilitated its delivery to the UK Embassy in Budapest. Much to his surprise, he found it equipped with a 100mm gun, advanced optics, and early night vision, far outpacing NATO equipment. 
Not only were the offensive features more advanced, but after determining the armor thickness, he concluded that no tank gun in the NATO arsenal could penetrate her frontal armor. In response to this, the British hastily completed their new L7 105mm cannon, a gun that would prove so lethal it would be placed onto the first prototypes of the M1 Abrams 20 years later. Meanwhile, back in the United States, American tank development had slowed. Looking to replace the M48, they had been tinkering with a prototype dubbed the T-95 medium tank. When discovery of the T-54's advanced technology was revealed, new life was breathed into the program. By May of 1957, it became clear the T-95 project was inadequate. The Office of Management and Budget, feeling the pressure from the T-54 discovery, authorized funding for an immediate replacement. The XM-60 was selected and would become America's first main battle tank, the M-60. While the M60 was still in pre-production, Berlin was in crisis. Escalating tensions between East and West Germany resulted in the Soviets pouring in advanced armor and the Americans pouring in nuclear-ready army and air force personnel. With the surge of American troops arriving in West Germany, American and West German leadership were eager to gain an advantage without using nuclear weapons. They recognized that the Soviet bloc all shared the same standard set of equipment, while NATO countries used a mix of incompatible weaponry. Robert McNamara, the Secretary of Defense and former Ford Motor Company executive, suggested the Americans and Germans form a joint venture to create a new standard main battle tank. This way, it could be adopted by all NATO nations to gain numerical superiority and feature the best technology from either nation to ensure Soviet defeat. By 1963, the Germans and the Americans signed a memorandum agreeing to the specifications. They organized a joint design team with equal representation from both countries. The project was dubbed the MBT-70. For the first phase of development, GM engineers would manage the Germans in Germany. For the second phase, the arrangement would be reversed. Germans would manage the Americans in America. Despite this understanding, and somewhat predictably, there were disputes over almost every part of the design. The gun, the engine, the use of both metric and SAE units in the separately manufactured components of the tank. The disagreement over metric and SAE was the worst by far. Development ground to a halt as the issue was elevated all the way to McNamara and the German defense minister, von Hassel. They were also unable to settle the disagreement. Engineers eventually decided to simply use a mix of metric and SAE, relying on conversions when they would change facilities. After the disagreements were settled, German engineers essentially refused to share ideas with the Americans only accepting the use of German technology for nearly all components. The reason being, procurement works differently in Germany. When a German company takes on a new defense contract, the company pays all the expenses of development and retains the intellectual property and profit if the vehicle is accepted. Whereas in the States, the Pentagon would compensate the companies for all their R&D effort and then convert the award to a production contract so the Germans had a financial incentive to use only their products, while the Americans had a financial incentive to refuse to cooperate and drag the project on for as long as possible. By 1967, the project debuted featuring the most ridiculous experimental technologies from both countries. Hydropneumatic suspension that could lower or raise the ride height, a 152mm auto-loading combination cannon and missile launcher featuring laser rangefinder, an experimental turbine engine, a floating copula for the driver who was seated inside of the turret, and a retractable, remote-controlled 20mm anti-aircraft gun. Shockingly, the tank barely worked. The cannon had a tendency to cook off rounds from the heat generated after a missile launch. The turbine engine failed in a dusty environment. The floating copula gave the driver motion sickness, 
and the anti-aircraft gun failed to deploy. The debut in Germany was a disaster. Smoke billowed from the tank after the turret's hydraulics malfunctioned. For the American debut, they decided not to turn it on. By 1970, after the project had reached five times its original budget, the Government Accountability Office stepped in, recommending the joint project file for divorce. The race for armor superiority had slowed after the 1969 release of the much-anticipated T-72, featuring a disappointing old-generation shape and vulnerably placed autoloader. The Cold War had begun a transitional period. Both Eastern and Western powers were facing an economic slump from overspending on defense budgets. Attention had shifted to an overall less expensive ballistic missile strategy, allowing the Air Force and their cutting-edge AWACS system to take the spotlight. Tensions between Russia and their former ally China broiled over nuclear strength. Attitudes shifted from direct confrontation to economic superiority. Recognizing that if NATO tanks would likely never face off against their Soviet counterparts, they needed to be made suitable for foreign military sale. But in a strange twist, just two years later, tanks would be back in focus. In 1972, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty was signed, sending the Air Force's AWACS looking for a new mission. In 1973, the Yom Kippur War was fought between Israel and the Arab Coalition, reigniting fears of a land war in Europe. The army renewed its solicitation for a new main battle tank, titling the project M1. Despite the Americans and Germans formally separating their joint MBT-70 project, the need for NATO standardization was still top of mind. While the Americans had developed the MBT-70 into the XM-803, a remarkably similar tank, the Germans had developed the MBT-70 into the Leopard 2, featuring a 120mm gun. In 1976, just three years after the initial solicitation, three tanks arrived at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds. The General Motors XM-1, featuring a 12-cylinder diesel engine, a small sleek turret, and a 105mm L7 gun. The Chrysler XM-1, featuring an experimental turbine engine, a much larger turret, which was also armed with the L7, and the German Leopard 2, featuring lighter weight, blistering speed, and a 120mm Rhine metal cannon. While the Americans found the Leopard to be excellent, it was never seriously considered in lieu of a domestic model. Chrysler's prototype, using an experimental turbine engine for fuel efficiency, turned out to be a gas guzzler. The GM had a reliable diesel engine, better armor, and a more accurate fire control system. The GM was also cheaper. But there were other factors at play. While the tank was still in testing, the Chrysler Corporation was in serious financial trouble. Facing bankruptcy, Chrysler's lobbyists made a play on Washington. During a time when the testing was supposed to be top secret, Chrysler lobbyists caught wind that GM was the likely winner. Utilizing an inside connection to the president's ear, they argued there was big money to be made if NATO adopted the new experimental turbine. If that didn't work, a major job loss at Chrysler would make global news headlines, boosting Soviet morale. Finally, if profits from the engine and the Soviets didn't sell them, Chrysler threatened to issue a formal protest to the Pentagon, dragging out the first tank project to be running on schedule in nearly 20 years. Meanwhile, at the Pentagon, the Air Force was in equal trouble. Their AWACS system no longer had a mission. Without the threat of Soviet ballistic missiles looming, the AWACS was converted into a mobile fighter control center, with the intended customer being Germany. Back in Germany, the German army was having issues selling the inflated price tag of their Leopard 2 tank. While the 120mm gun was the main feature, customers weren't exactly lining up at the door. With issues of their own, they had no interest in buying the American AWACS. Soon, there were two men waiting outside of the office of the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld, an Air Force general and a Chrysler executive. The Air Force had something to offer 
and Chrysler had something to gain. The Germans were willing to buy the Air Force's AWACS if the Army agreed to use their overpriced cannon on the M1. And giving Chrysler the M1 contract would save jobs, scoring Rumsfeld major political points. On that fateful July afternoon in 1977, Rumsfeld called the Pentagon, and the Pentagon called the project's congressional liaison, informing him he had picked the wrong winner for the M1 project. Four months later, the M1 main battle tank was presented to Congress. Featuring an experimental turbine engine, a German-made 120mm cannon, and Chrysler stamped into the sheet metal. It would take eight more years before the issues with the gun could be completely resolved. But this isn't another story about corruption in the military-industrial complex. Rather, it's a story of the Cold War. A story of how sometimes economic prosperity can mean national security. Today, even critics of the Abrams admit it's one of the best weapon systems ever made having proven itself in combat. Many early issues with the engine and cannon have been resolved, after an extra billion dollars in R&D. The project gave Rumsfeld the clout to continue on to lifelong political service, and gave several Army and Air Force generals an extra star. It saved the Chrysler Corporation, who would sell the project to General Dynamics just five years later and the German army was finally able to justify their pricey Leopard II. Lieutenant Colonel Mormon went on to be a congressional staffer and then a VP at Lockheed Martin 